So I trust I have been introduced and you have some idea of who just flew in from Canada. Um, I'm supposed to go backwards in time now from what I think I just heard and speak about the revolution of 1989. Um, and I'd like to start by asking why it's worth... Can you all hear me or should I use the microphone? Fine. Um, fine. Okay, I'm a professional teacher so I'm used to talking loud. Um, so why should we go back to the revolutions of 1989? One reason is that they marked the beginning of the quarter century that we lived in following, or roughly a quarter century, a period of history that is now coming to an end, as you may have noticed. And certain myths of the revolutions of 1989 were used to justify that order which prevailed until the past few years. But if we look at what really happened in 1989 in what was then called Eastern Europe, we see other ways that history might have unfolded. And this is important because they suggest new ideas that we could consider for our future rather than just returning to tired old ideas. Because there were new ideas in 1989, particularly in Slovakia and the Czech Republic. So I'm going to be giving you a synopsis of a book that I wrote about the revolution of 1989 in Czechoslovakia. It, was, it came out first for the 20th anniversary in Slovak, and then a few years later I published it in English. Uh, but the Slovak cover is much prettier than the English one, so this is what you get to see. The book is based on research I conducted in about 40 archives and libraries across both the Czech and Slovak republics, uh, most of which, when I began work in the mid-90s, were already open. So I was looking at materials that were lying around that no one bothered to look at, largely because they were mostly outside the capitals. Uh, very few resources were actually closed. The kinds of sources I consider are sources that ordinary citizens themselves came into contact with or produced during the revolutionary period of November and December 1989 and into the early 90s. So what you see here, for example, are flyers that were frequently posted on shop windows or bulletin boards, even in small towns and villages. Uh, frequently produced by students uh, or some of the revolutionary associations that I'll be talking about. In addition, there were ad hoc bulletins. Uh, initially, they came out because the official press was censored, so students and then these revolutionary associations began publishing their own periodicals. And then in workplaces, workers gathered and wrote petitions, open letters, lists of demands, and there are thousands and thousands of these documents available for researchers to look at. Um, unfortunately, I'm the only one so far who has thought them worth looking at. No one else has really cared about what ordinary citizens were actually thinking and doing in 1989. Instead, they've all looked at what the famous people in Prague and maybe Bratislava have done. But if we look at what citizens themselves were saying and doing, we see the birth of a democratic political culture in 1989. Something that citizens actually had to participate in and actually had to create from the ground up. Democracy is, after all, the demos, people, citizens. Without civic participation, you don't have democracy. So this is what the book is about, how citizens themselves created a democratic political culture. And I'm going to suggest that the revolutionary period from 1989 until 1992 was experienced in four different phases, beginning with a romantic phase. And this quote illustrates the point of view that people had during this romantic phase, which began in November 1989, seeing the revolutionary struggle as a struggle between good and evil where one would decisively triumph. Okay? Uh, what you should see here is a picture of, which maybe you've all seen, a picture of Prague on November 17, 1989. Uh, it's nothing to do with the, the, your program, it's just the format of the picture. 
Um, I formatted it on a Mac, and you're probably using a PC. So, um, but this is a picture of an, a conflict that occurred on November 17th in Prague, which was International Students' Day. Prague students had permission to organize a commemorative march for when 50 years previously, in 1939, Czech students had been killed by Nazis. The march went to the National Cemetery and then, for a variety of reasons, it ended up continuing down to downtown Prague, where it was intercepted by riot police, and about 5,000 of the marchers were cut off and beaten up by the police, leaving over 500 heavily injured. This then led students to go on strike, and you see here uh, the official emblem of the Czechoslovak student movement that was established in the wake of what was called the massacre in Prague. Students saw themselves as knights on shiny horseback rushing to save their country. Um, and a little later, Slovak students in Bratislava came up with their own emblem, but also encapsulating this romantic idea. We are, the student movement represents love, which should be in contradistinction to violence. So we can see this, mo this first moment from November 17th as a big bang of signifiers, from which a lot of people began generating new ideas, began forming new civic networks. The students organized, actors organized. They both went on permanent strikes and called on all citizens to join them in a general strike 10 days later. On the occasion of this general strike on November 27th, Half of all workers in Czechoslovakia stopped work for two hours. Many of them, as you see here in, um, I think this is Banska Bistrica, went to the town squares for a manifestation, saying, we, the citizens, are here, and we expect the powers that be to listen to us. Another quarter expressed symbolic, uh, symbolic solidarity with the strike movement, even, even if they didn't actually stop work by putting the tricolor on their clothing, or so forth. This was a dramatic turning point because it showed that the most of the population was definitely opposed to the ruling communist regime. And the constitutional clause that guaranteed the Communist Party a leading role in society was abolished two days later. But this did not mean that people went home. Once they had assembled in public space, they rather liked being assembled in public space. And moreover, they knew that even if the Constitution has changed, that doesn't mean that in reality everything is going to change. So they continued to meet on public squares throughout the rest of 1989 and into 1990 as well. Uh, I believe this is from Galanta in southern Slovakia. So meetings like this were spaces where people would articulate their ideas, their expectations for the future society, a new society, as many people began to call it. At the same time, these civic associations, Public Against Violence, uh, or Berios Protinasiliu, and Civic Forum, or Obchanske Forum, began spreading in workplaces and municipalities throughout the country, and at their height in December 1989, over half of all citizens were participating in one of these two associations. So a massive outburst of civic participation. We can describe this period of November and December 1989 as a period of collective effervescence. Not only were people meeting to discuss, but they also organized what were called happenings. Uh, you see here students from Bratislava and Nitra boarding a train, which then went to Košice, and they stopped in every town to pass out literature about the revolutionary movement and try to encourage more people to participate. Here you have in Bratislava students and citizens forming a human chain, which physically connected people as, and showed their determination to continue this movement until a victorious end. Some of these chains could be 20 or 30 kilometers long. 
sometimes connecting different towns with one another. Um, and, and really making visible the idea that we are a, a united community in opposition to the powers that be. One of the biggest of these happenings took place on December 10, 1989, when about 100,000 citizens, mostly from Bratislava and the environments, walked 10 kilometers into Austria. And they cut down barbed wire from along the border, and an artist turned the barbed wire into a heart. Again, representing the idea that the revolution is taking what violence the bar represented by the barbed wire and turning it into community, represented by the heart. During this period, there was a tremendous outburst of verbiage, people writing poetry, music, um, trying to express the ideas for their new society. And one of the most common of the flyers posted on these shop windows were these Ten Commandments of our revolution. And if you really want to read them in detail, you can read them in the book, um, or I can email them to you later. Another similar document, also very widely reproduced, was called The Eight Rules of Dialogue, about how to conduct a dialogue in public space, which insisted, among other things, that you must treat your fellow interlocutors with respect, respect their human dignity, you must both seek truth rather than trying to undercut your opponent, but see yourselves as partners in a common endeavor. It would be kind of nice if we adopted some of these principles in the United States today. The discussion taking place now everywhere, in public spaces, in workplaces, literally everywhere at the end of 1989, was primarily about the nature of human relations. And we can see this in the de lists of demands that workers wrote and sent to Prague and Bratislava to be considered for state, a statewide program. So I went through and I counted demands from these lists that workers sent to the capitals. And if you aggregate the demands into a few categories, you see that they're mostly about political representation, working conditions, symbolic representation, for example, getting rid of the Communist Party slogans from the workplace, fairness, um, telling us the truth about what happened on November 17th, or on August 21st, 1968, when the Soviets invaded, only 1% were actually about materialistic demands, like higher wages, lower taxes, or things like that. So, this defeats the argument that what, people, what citizens in Eastern Europe wanted in 1989 was just to have Western living standards. That doesn't mean they didn't want to live better economically, but the revolution was primarily about social relations and political relations. This was a very mature revolution, if you will. People knew what they were doing. Lists of demands, though, were not, of course, the only documents. They were a small subset. If we look at all the documents and the logic that citizens used to argue for their demands, we can arrange the common ideals of the revolution in a chart that looks somewhat like this. And I would argue that there were five core ideals of the revolution that were regularly and frequently used to justify other demands. These five core ideals were nonviolence, self-organization, democracy, fairness, and humanness. And I'm going to speak just briefly about each one. So nonviolence was the first ideal that the revolution articulated. And of course, it was a response to the violence that had begun the revolution on November 7th. So against violence from the side of the regime, students said it should be possible to run a state without recourse to violence. But it was also against violence from the people. There were some calls for revenge. And students and other leaders made, tried to make sure that there would not be violent revenge, as had happened in previous revolutions in European history. The understanding of nonviolence was quite exalted, if you will. So people explicitly said that nonviolence is not just being against physical violence, but we're against economic violence, social violence, environmental violence, 
So quite a sweeping critique of all kinds of violence. Um, and of course, nonviolence was connected with the ideal of love as an opposite of violence. This was the theme song of the revolution in Slovakia, written just a few days after the massacre in Prague. And you can see that it's written as a narrative about what happened in Prague. We saw them who raised their, their hands. Um, it, their hands were empty and it was still dark. They were beaten. And since that moment, years have passed. It's been a few days, but we now live in a completely different century. And again, you can read this in the book if, if you really want to. Self-organization was a precondition of the strike movement. Citizens had to organize themselves. No one was going to organize them. And citizens managed to demonstrate that order could be, could be maintained without violence. There were crowds of hundreds of thousands, and the flower beds were not disturbed. The crowds voluntarily parted to let an ambulance pass. So these were very disciplined citizens, showing the maturity of the civic movement in Czechoslovakia, which people saw as the antithesis of a system that needed to regulate and direct everything. Citizens were capable of organizing themselves. And they could do so with great spontaneity and informality. This was freedom. Democracy was experienced directly already in November when people began electing strike committees to run the strike movement. People wanted democracy without qualification because, of course, the communists had always said that they had a democratic system. Uh, it was democratic centralism or this or that. We want, and citizens said, no, we just want democracy, <coughs> period. But they wanted to make sure that democracy would be with accurate representation so that the people they elected would actually represent them. So they wanted to be sure, for example, that people of various social backgrounds were represented in representative assemblies. They wanted even the ability to recall delegates to assemblies if these delegates should betray popular trust. And they wanted free elections at all levels, not just in politics, but also in the economic sphere which of course made sense because the economic sphere was entirely subordinated to the political sphere. Everything was state owned. Democracy was also associated with dialogue, which should be, they said, with all components of society. Everyone should have a right to participate. And this should be consequential dialogue, not just a talking shop, but it should matter. Interestingly, um, Though there were a lot of jokes about communist apparatchiks now having to wield shovels and become like the workmen that they said that they actually defended, people were not against total social level leveling. They were not against justified inequality. Uh, so if people worked harder, they thought, yes, these people should earn more, but higher wages should not be based on political favors. They were against corruption, which was endemic to the communist system, and as we'll see at the very end, uh, never really went away. Um, and they saw rule of law as a means of combating corruption. Humanity, I would argue, was the central ideal of the revolution of 1989. It was used more frequently than any other ideal to justify the others. The new society should be a society for people that will take into account the inherent unpredictability of human beings and, not, and will not try to categorize everyone or predict in advance what all people will fall into. So it should be a system with flexibility or individual variation and the unpredictable. A system that will cultivate life, which is unpredictable. This ideal of humanity has deep roots, as you may know, in Czechoslovak history. The first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomáš Garík Masaryk, had tried to create a state that would defend the humane ideal. And of course, the main slogan of the Prague Spring in 1968 was to create socialism with a human base. 
worth noting because the ideal of socialism was also widely invoked in 1989, something that has largely been forgotten. It was not one of the core ideals, meaning that people did not invoke socialism in order to justify other demands, but in these primary documents from November and December, lots of people, when they imagined an, a change, were thinking of going back to where they had left off when the Soviet tanks had invaded in August 1968. So they thought in terms of their own history rather than looking across the border. So there were sincere calls for renewing socialism rather than dismantling it, though there was some geographic cleavage here. Prague and Bratislava were more willing to move to a market economy than the rest of the country was, for kind of understandable economic reasons. And we see subsequently the capitals have done very well, the rest of the countries not so well economically. Initially, no one, nobody at all in Czechoslovakia said that they needed to turn the clock back more than 20 years. No one condemned the entire 40 years of communism until after the general strike, 10 days after the revolution had begun. For the first 10 days, it was all about picking up where they had left off in August 1968. And many people even said that we want to create a new kind of socialism, the modern face of socialism, whatever that might be. And this is where things began to fall apart, when people had to specify what exactly this would be. They realized, we don't know. But surveys conducted in November and December support the textual evidence that I ran across that most people were still inclined to continue in a socialist way. This was a representative survey conducted in, first in November and December, although you do see a slight change toward mo more openness towards something that would be in between. And this trend would, of course, continue until by a year later the proportions would be reversed and most people would want to jettison socialism altogether. Um, again, you don't see the pictures, but this debate was shown in a debate in December 1989 about who the next president should be. On the squares, people were calling for Alexander Dubček to be president. And he was really happy with that, wanted to be it. Um, it was only as a result of much persuasion that supporters of Václav Havel persuaded Dubček to withdraw his candidacy, clearing the way for Havel to be elected unanimously by the federal parliament on December 29th as the new Czechoslovak president. But this debate was couched in terms of whether we're going to pick up where we left off in 1968, which Dubček supporters wanted to do, or whether this is going to be some kind of a new departure, which is what Havel supporters wanted. And most students supported Havel, even in Slovakia. And due to the credibility of the students for having started everything, they also changed public opinion in support of Havel by the end of December, in both countries. At the same time in December, nonetheless, we can see some of what people are thinking in terms of democratized workplaces by elections that took place within workplaces. In accordance with a communist law that had never been put into practice, but technically existed on the books, which allowed a majority of workers in a workplace to fire their director if they wanted to, and appoint a new one. So people said, now we have democracy, we can actually do this. And they began doing this, but then they met with opposition from the nomenclatura, these party-appointed managers and directors who did not want to leave their positions, which led workers to threaten to go on strike if the managers did not actually leave. And this led to a turning point in the revolution, which leads us to the next phase. And the next phases go a lot faster than this first one, because the first one was really decisive. I characterize the next phase as comedy, and this is using literary criticism, which sees comedy as a story with a happy end that reconciles most of the participants in the drama. Everybody gets married at the ends, and we all live happily ever after. 
the kind of idea that you see in this excerpt from a Václav Havel speech in December of 1989. Whereas the, romantic, the romantic perspective had seen communism as evil, we're the good people in opposition to that. Here we have Havel saying, wait, the communists are just people like us. We can all live together in a happy family. And the government that was created in December reflecting this was even called the government of national understanding even though communists occupied about half the seats in that government still. And Parliament was still mostly communist. Um, but I mentioned a bit ago that this unrest in workplaces led to a turning point. This came on January 19, 1990, when leading spokesmen in Civic Forum and Public Against Violence went on federal television to tell workers to cut it out. Stop trying to affect these changes in your workplaces because that's threatening to destabilize our economy. Instead, wait until there are elections and there's a new parliament, which will then create laws that will regulate the situation from above. So instead of, taking, instead of citizens taking things into their own hands, wait until lawmakers will do it for you. An interesting development in the history of democracy. We see the immediate outcome of this speech um, in terms of the formation of, the, of these civic associations, public against violence and civic forum. Right after the speech, it drops radically. What this led to was a destabilization of the civic movement because there was now uncertainty. We thought what we were doing was democratic, and now you're saying it's not. This doesn't make sense. So the civic movements became divided. Um, Four days later, Václav Havel went into the federal parliament to try to restore civic unity by proposing to rally people around symbols. He proposed to do this by cutting out the word socialist from the name of the country. Instead of the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, it would just be the Czechoslovak Republic. But then some communist Slovak deputies, supporters of Dubček, among others, said, wait a minute. This is a good time to consider whether we want to call this Czechoslovakia without a hyphen or with a hyphen, and whether Slovakia should be capitalized, which led to a three-month debate that got people really engaged called the hyphen war. <laughs> Finally, they adopted a very elegant solution, the Czech and Slovak Federative Republic. But what had happened was that the earlier debate about whether we're picking up where we left off in 68 or starting anew is forgotten. And instead of a debate about socialism, we have now a debate about the Federation. And Dubček, who was initially supported by Czechs as well as Slovaks, was increasingly sidelined as just a Slovak, rather than somebody that Czechs would appeal or like as well. Um, during the spring of 1990, there were center-periphery divides between, within the civic, civic movements that emerged. This is a map of the spectrum of civic associations in Slovakia in November 1989. What you see is that initially, when citizens began organizing themselves, about half of them oriented themselves around the civic movement founded in Prague. Civic Forum. The Civic Forum founded in Banska Bistrica even said, public against violence, which was founded in Bratislava, is just a Bratislava thing. We should ignore it. Eventually, Bratislava had to fight to gain the right to speak in the name of the entire civic movement in Slovakia. Uh, it succeeded by the end of 1989, although especially in Košice, there remained significant opposition to being represented by Bratislava. As you may know, most people outside Bratislava hate Bratislava. <laughs> they think they're too stuck up. Um, and the same is true among Czechs vis-a-vis -vis Prague as well. You see another example of this kind of geographic division in this a survey conducted in March 1990 about how fast there should be economic <coughs> transition. And you see that East Slovakia and West Slovakia were on different pages here. This is one of the things that helped lead to the split. But you also see that Koshi 
it's more along the lines of what Prague was doing. Uh, Kosciuszka even went so far as to suggest dividing the Federation into four parts rather than two, with East Slovakia as its own thing, so that they wouldn't have to be under Bratislava's thumb. What was happening, though, was that a cleavage was emerging between citizens outside the capitals and the leaders of the civic movements in the capitals. This would become explosive in 1990. Part of the cleavage was geographic, but part of it was also social. This is a graph uh, representing the occupations of local activists in civic forum. Unfortunately, we don't have data for public against violence, but I assume it was similar. Uh, so this lists all the jobs. You see that ordinary workers were the most common. But if we divide it according to the education that these people had to have, and here we do have complete evidence from one Slovak district, which looks very similar to the aggregate Czech data. What is significant here is that we see that the majority of these local civic leaders are qualified manual laborers or qualified non-manual laborers, or the technical intelligentsia. The cultural intelligentsia was a small minority. Whereas if you look instead at Bratislava and Prague, you see that the leaders of Civic Forum and Public Against Violence are from the cultural intelligentsia. So not only is there a geographic cleavage, but there is a social cleavage. This would become important in the third phase, arguing that the revolution has gone off course. Something went wrong, and various partisan groups came forward saying, we know how to fix it. <coughs> uh, Václav Klaus in the Czech Republic was one of these. You'll hear about another fellow, you've already heard about it, but I'll say a bit more. <coughs> There were increasing, so new elections took place for the federal parliament and the republican parliaments in June 1990. They proceeded to re-elect Havel as president, and then they went on vacation for two months. So if you're ever in a revolutionary situation, remember, do not go on vacation. <laughs> Citizens are expecting you to do something. And so throughout the summer, while parliament is on vacation, these civic activists, are coming under increasing pressure from their constituents. Why is the nomenclatura still in power? Why has no one been, pun no one been punished for the massacre in November 1989? Why, indeed, are workers who spoke out in November 1989 being punished by the directors who are still there? Over the summer, these local civic associations sent a string of appeals to the coordinators of Public Against Violence and Civic Forum in the capitals, begging them to do something. We won the elections. Why isn't anything happening? And the leaders in Prague and Bratislava dismissed all of these as groundless. Finally, in late summer, after, on the anniversary of the 1968 invasion, Václav Pavel called for a second revolution, the presidium of the parliament went ahead with procedures whereby various ministries could change directors and managers in workplaces. But Civic Forum was not allowed to have any part in this, and Public Against Violence had already been expelled from the workplaces on the orders of the leaders of Public Against Violence in Bratislava. This led to conflict in, the, in September when conventions of the civic associations took place. <clears throat> so, at Public Against Violence's September convention, there was dismay that their popular leader, uh, whose name, just by the way, was Jan Budai, was stepping down because he had been accused by Vladimir Metscher, it later turned out, of having collaborated with the secret police. Turned out he hadn't, but the, the, the accusation was enough to render him unfit for office. So he stepped down, even though he was very popular among all these people outside Bratislava. Because of rules for how the new chairman would be elected, giving excess votes to Bratislava, uh, it turned out that one of Budai's rivals, 
from Bratislava who was elected as the new chairman. And the new Slovak council had only 7 out of 25 members who were not from Bratislava. So this made civic activists from the rest of the country mad. The next month they met on their own initiative, just all these district activists in the town of Turnova, where they created the Turnova Initiative, calling for the democratization of public against violence from within. Um, this led in the spring of 1990, finally, to a split within public against violence where Vladimir Mechiar became the new champion of all the civic activists from outside the capital. Very similar to what happened in the Czech Republic, where over the summer Václav Klaus had gone traveling outside the capital, building rapport with ordinary civic activists, saying, I understand your grief with these intellectuals in Prague, I will do something about it. So Klaus and Mechiar essentially then were elected from below to take over these civic associations and democratize them. And this leads to, what you see here, a, a newspaper cartoon from the time which shows Klaus doing this. Um, I don't have an equivalent picture from Metzger from the time, um, but lately there was a film about him which gives you some of the idea. There were pictures like this at the time, although I haven't found them. But they were seen as saviors who were going to really get the people out of the stagnation they had gotten into in the summer of 1990 and get the revolution back on track. And so when they were elected, people actually said this, now we're going to complete the revolution. And this led to the final phase, a phase of irony, where somehow things didn't turn out the way you expected at the beginning. And now people began even saying, well, all this excitement we had at the beginning was really for nothing. There was no revolution after all. In the end, nothing has really changed. In the sense that ordinary citizens are still not able to influence what happens in their country. This was exemplified in 1992 by the fact that Klaus's party and Mechiar's party, which both campaigned in the spring of 1992 on the promise to preserve the Federation, as soon as they were elected, decided to break apart. Even though opinion polls in both countries said most citizens wanted to keep it together. And two and a half million people in a country of 15 million signed a petition demanding a referendum on the question. And Klaus and Mechiar said the elections were a referendum, even though in the elections we campaigned saying we would do the opposite of what we're doing. Um, so this naturally led a lot of people to feel that democracy had failed. The will of the people is not being done. Even though Klaus and Mechiar were the most popular politicians in their countries, but they had a plurality, not an absolute majority. So this was the state in which Slovakia was for mo most of the rest of the 1990s. Uh, you've heard about what happened in 1998 already. I'm just going to jump ahead to the, the Slovak Spring of 2018. This is where I'm going to end. But we see here once again the public against violence in Slovakia. As you may know, in February of this year, an investigative journalist and his fiancée were murdered in Slovakia for having exposed corruption by some Slovak politicians, probable involvement with the Italian Mafia. And this led hundreds of thousands of Slovak citizens once again to take an active part in public affairs, to take a stand on their town squares across the country, resulting in the resignation of the Prime Minister and his cabinet. It's not yet clear where this is all going to go, um, but if you know much about what's happening in the rest of Central Europe right now, you know that Hungary and Poland are moving back in the direction of party dictatorship, Slovakia is a place, an island in Central Europe, where citizens are still very mature, still very well organized, and capable of forcing the powers that be, from time to time, to listen. So, thank God for Slovakia. Thank you. How do you want to...